All right, we are going to move along to um, Jean Vaccaro, uh, whose talk, I believe, will pick up threads literally from um, our first presentation from today, uh, Julia Bryan Wilson's presentation on The Handmaid, um, but also on the refusal of medical diagnosis that we just heard about uh, in Mel Chen's work. So, Jean Vaccaro is a Mellon postdoctoral fellow in feminist arts and sciences at UC Davis, which actually has a program in textile, um, textile arts. Uh, she's the curator of Bring Your Own Body, Transgender Between Archives and Aesthetics. It was organized for Cooper Union and a co-founder of the NYC Transoral Project. Um, what to say about Jean? She is a wholly eccentric thinker in the best possible way. She's offered the experience of touch as an alternative method for reading trans bodies and describes under the heading of The Handmaid a logic of knowing that departs totally from diagnostic forms of classification that have mediated trans people's ability to say who we are. Her work offers a gorgeous understanding of embodiment through the world-making activities of craft and crafting and opens out onto visual methodologies deployed by various artists for representing without fetishizing bodies that may either seamlessly pass or might seem lodged between systems of representation. Um, so it's a refusal of the tidy, an offering up of a practice that is based in craft and a completely eccentric uh, way of interacting with trans and variant, other kinds of variant bodies. Jean Fakira. Thank you, Jack, so much. I would just want to echo what everyone has said, that it is really a privilege to be here um, under the intellectual and political conceit that you have all organized, and really an honor to be in conversation with everyone today. I'm so thankful to you, Jack, and to Yorinda and Yort and everyone involved in this uh, project. Let's see. Oh. I already screwed up the tech. That's my signature. OK, um, this has five parts. Thank you. And part one, out of distracted vision. How is the infrastructural eye of diagnosis felt? To begin to think about the question, I offer some vignettes exploring the intersection of diagnostic and aesthetic taxonomies. A photograph of Christine Jorgensen at the Kinsey Institute in 1953, the distraction doodles made by sexologist John Money in the 1960s, and the drawings of punk artist Chloe Faith Zubilo from the 1990s and 2000s. Although made by different kinds of people at different moments in history, all share a problem, a problem in the sense of a question, a problem question about the everyday. In his 1991 essay, Tactility and Distraction, cultural anthropologist Michael Tausig narrates a meditative moving through the streets of New York City, doing the ordinary task of taking his child to a field trip at the Museum of Natural History. In his Benjamin reading of architecture, Tausig considers the unconscious mind, senses of touch, and what he calls optical dissolving, or the, quote, ability to sense other everydaynesses. He writes of tactile optics as, quote, an embodied and somewhat automatic knowledge that functions like peripheral vision, not studied contemplation, a knowledge that is imageric and sensate rather than ideational, a knowledge that lies as much in the objects and spaces of observation as in the body and mind of the observer. As archives require a continual intervention, I excavate sexology, a discipline which understands itself as an empiricist knowledge project with the epistemological disposition of distraction. In the vignettes of Jorgensen, Money, and Zubilo, we can see and feel the problem question of other everydaynesses. Across different relations of power, access, and positionality to transgender is the construction of a parallel everyday, mediating histories of the sciences of sex to performatively animate the sexological imaginary of transgender. In mining the sexological archive, the violence of the capture of identity and the persistence of diagnosis, I think with tactility growing out of distracted vision to propose a conceptual architecture of transgender as handmade. 
The blurry and felt sensorium of distracted vision indexes a capacity to know transgender beyond the binary's underwriting taxonomy and apprehension, elaborating in aesthetics of the category we may yet come to know as trans. The handmade is an orientation to the ordinary labors of making identity, a plural formation in the shapes and surfaces of experience. Opening onto unknown and unthought encounters between objects of study and embodiment, it encourages us to reorient how our eyes look, wander, pause, search, and desire to know, make contact, and learn in contact. Tracking the conceptual architecture of aesthetics and taxonomy alongside bodily experiences of identity, I aim to animate the sensorium of the eyes, training us into a method of optical dissolving, feeling for the everyday and handmade textures of transgender. Two, a feeling for institutions. In 1953, William Dellenbach photographed Christine Jorgensen at the Institute for Sex Research in Bloomington, Indiana. As staff photographer at the Institute between 1949 and 1994, Dellenbach recorded the workplace of sexology, research activities, collections of art and artifacts, staff portraits, and retirement parties. Dellenbach's black and white photograph of Jorgensen is something of a routine matter. On her visit to the Institute, Alfred Kinsey took Jorgensen's sex history, although the data he collected from her and others on the gender variant spectrum and African American participants is not counted in his volumes on female and male sexual behavior. He interviewed about 6,000 people who were not included uh, in the reports. Dellenbach photographed Jorgensen in the corridor of Mor Morrison Hall, a limestone building on the south edge of Indiana University. Staged against the set of the institution, linoleum flooring, notices lining a corkboard, and bare light bulbs, it is a day at work for Jorgensen and for Dellenbach and Kinsey. She isn't looking at the camera. Her body is turning away. Kinsey, a collector and taxonomist, accumulated what he termed visual data of gender identity. And by 1948, he'd recorded the sex histories of nine trans women and two trans men. The data of sex and gender he collected laid a taxonomic foundation for sexologists to parse infinitely sex and gender difference and to proliferate an era of nomenclature distinctly different than earlier inquiries into the psychopathology of perversions. The Kinsey archives contain visual data of drag performances, newspaper articles, chronicling gender surveillance and policing, and community newsletters of cross-dressing networks like the Hose and Heels Club, organized in the Los Angeles home of Virginia Prince in 1961. The photography collection catalog TS and TV for transsexuality and transvestism is a collection primarily of white bodies. It contains around 2,000 images, and I'd say less than five of people of color. One of those images is this mug shot from the Baltimore Police Department from the 1960s. It's part of a collection actually donated by the police department. Looking back onto the sexological archives demands a careful ethical consideration of the processes of historical recovery as we reconcile the enduring legacies of diagnosis and the anonymity of many of the subjects chronicled in the archive. And, you know, a way to kind of think about how to critique how the institution itself defends and protects structural violence. It is a form of interpretive work to recover the textures of experience flattened by archi archival capture and to reanimate the scene of relation which allowed archives like Kinsey's to come into existence. Laboring to encounter the archive and its continual formation, one thing we can see the lens of scientism ev evidencing is the processual matter of sexology as bur burgeoning institution. And just to say something quickly about the image you see here, this is a, a survey that was conceived and um, sort of in collaboration with Kinsey and was included in the publication uh, Transvestia. So if you ordered a copy of Transvestia, which was started by Virginia Prince, kind of coined the term trans transgenderist, then you would, you would get as well this survey that would go back to Kinsey. So there was really a very kind of strange collaborative network between diagnosticians and self-defined uh, gender variant communities. <clears throat> 
Kinsey's holdings on gender identity do not contain specimen files or medical photography. He collected cultural artifacts, many donated by individuals for whom the institute was both safe haven and legitimizing scientific authority. Collected alongside cultural ephemera, the holdings of sexologists illustrate how in the years before the invention of a diagnostic apparatus to pathologize and administer gender identity, sexological company men maintained robust private correspondences working through theories of sex difference and adjudicating the merit of patients seeking hormone therapies and surgeries. Sexology as a science is composed of both its is composed of both its taxonomic practices and archival formations. As historian of science, Lorraine Datsun writes, an archive is a discipline's wager on its own longevity. Photographed in the basement of the Institute for Sex Research, Jorgensen is visual data in Kinsey's taxonomic schema. But what does her visual data evidence? In 1952, the international news media fixated its photographic lens on her to extract and stabilize the difference of her identity and rewrite the story of her mutable gender into a narrative of white femininity and heterosexual binaries. The, photographic, the photograph of Jorgensen at the Institute, however, is something different. Not oriented to the public, it circulates only as an internal record of the bureaucracy of sex classification. A reading practice attuned to and accommodating of the protracted and sometimes banal historical relations between the sexological apparatus and transgender life allows us to see the way Dellenbach's photograph evidences a familiar boredom with the institutional sciences of sex. Turned on the institution, the sexological camera captures Jorgensen in a basement hallway, looking away. Her gaze instructs us to inquire after the space outside the frame. Three. Do the infrastructures of diagnosis touch? The eccentric sex researcher John Money, a maximalist, wrote 40 some odd books and more than 500 articles. He invented hundreds of words and ideas. Some, like love map and mind brain in haphazard pop psychological circulation, and others, like behavior on normophilia and aspirational pedophilia, long forgotten. Born in New Zealand, he emigrated to the United States in the 1950s and bequeathed his archive to the Kinsey Institute. It contains drafts of his manuscripts and personal correspondence, his collection of Maori sculpture, and embargoed patient files detailing his work with gender variant children and pedophiles. Money was not a physician, psychologist, or psychiatrist, but he administered diagnosis to intersex, trans, and gender variant children and adults at Johns Hopkins as director of its gender identity clinic. And his administration of gender as a taxonomic was forged out of those bodies and bodily encounters. Money described the science-esque discipline of sexology as fuckology, a queer sounding science. This is a self-portrait of John Money, a photo collage with his own hair made in 1966 <laughs> on a Xerox company advertisement. <laughs> Can you see the Xerox? Oh, you can't see it, it is. <laughs> Alongside his enormous output of scientific writing and research on psychoendocrinology, Money made groovy drawings and doodles of forensic criminology, male and female anatomy, and phrenology, diagramming and deconstructing concepts of diagnosis, pedophilia, and paraphilia. Money understood himself as an artist making artworks. Excavating his artistic output parallel to his conceptual inquiries into gender and the plasticity of social form, we can see how aesthetics interact, intersect, and become inseparable from the institutional forms of diagnosis. Money's distraction doodles from 1960 on contain psychedelic neon drawings of shapes, objects, humans, animals, and human animals. And Money doodled a lot. He draws miniature works with felt tip pen for projection onto a wall of a museum or a gallery. In 1966, Money began the Gender Identity Clinic at Johns Hopkins with the support of Reed Erickson, a wealthy, uh, also eccentric, uh, trans man and philanthropist with, uh, let me get to the, this is the psychoanalyst is the new phrenologist. I just want to show you Reed and then I'll go back. Because I, where is Reed? Okay, here's Reed Erickson with his pet leopard. Oh. That's important. Um, 
So Reed Erickson had a family fortune of about $40 million made in uh, Texas oil money. And the Erickson Educational Foundation, which was his philanthropic organization, let me go back, um, financed uh, the gender identity clinic at Hopkins in the first six years, donating about $70,000 um, to support their, their research and healthcare. In the, the opening years of the clinic, 3,000 people solicited the clinic for gender affirming healthcare. They had to be vetted by a Hopkins group that was composed of a psychiatrist, urologist, surgeon, psychoendocrinologist, lawyer, and medical lawyer. Of those 3,000 who sought healthcare, only 20 received it. The Erickson Educational Foundation also financed John Lilly's Dolphin Communications Research and the Park Avenue Practice of Harry Benjamin, author of The Transsexual Phenomenon, and physician to Erickson and Jorgensen. Money wrote his thesis on hermaphrodism, theorizing a relation of non-causality between genital morphology and sex role. He received his doctorate in social relations at Harvard, an interdisciplinary program chaired by social action theorist Talcott Parsons. Stanley Milgram and Clifford Geertz are other notable graduates of uh, social relations. While there, Money was classmates with Dick Price, co-founder of Esalen, the intentional community in Big Sur, California, exploring new age forms of personhood, gestalt therapy, and group encounter. Money's cock on wheels drawn at Esalen in 1980 is pretty stunning. <laughs> uh, this is the origins of violence, also drawn at Esalen. A brief sketch of biography illustrates how histories of diagnosis entangle with efforts at, at gender self-determination, human potential, and the psychedelic as an aesthetic and induced state. Money's biography is disciplinary allegory, his eccentric affiliations and networks reflecting the emergent and uneven sciences of sex. Money's drawings in pen and pencil record his comings and goings around the world, a reflection of sexology as a colonial knowledge project. This radical lesbian feminist tree, which I find very compelling, um, was made at the Kinsey Institute in 1986. And you can see that some of his doodles are kind of evoke the groovy 60s and others are more imitative of or kind of desiring, we should say, of a primitive imaginary and kind of returning us to the erotics of violence. Money scribbles on what is close at hand. Oh, let me go to something like this. Okay, yeah. Um, so here you can see that he is using the Johns Hopkins medical uh, slides. Money scribbles on what is close at hand. Uh, slides belonging to the pathology department at the Johns Hopkins Medical School designated as art. He often made notes and drawings on university and hospital memos, gala invitations, and symposia schedules, inviting us to interrogate the relation of the decorative and distracted to the mar minor and marginal, to ask if his doodles can be understood as a microcosm or symptom of a total environment of sexological knowing. To many, gender is accumulative, both as a form and a taxonomic. Out of bodies and bodily encounters, he spawns phylisms like sex derivative, sex adjunctive, sex arbitrary, and sex adventitious. In 1955, in a bulletin for Johns Hopkins, he parses gender role and gender identity, anticipating a feminist insight into gender as a social construct. He tinkers with the order of his words and with the conjunctive and the placement of a pause. All tinkers in the grammar of gender. In 1988, in Gay, Straight, and In Between, Money explains, quote, used strictly and correctly, gender is more inclusive than sex. It is umbrella under which all are sheltered all the different components of sex difference. He later writes of, quote, gender identity errors and gender transpositions, and declares he finds, quote, no proven cause of gender identity disorder. In Sexual Signatures in 1975, Money writes, quote, the critical period for gender identity differentiation coincides with the critical period for language learning. You were wired but not programmed for gender in the same sense that you were wired but not programmed for language, end quote. To be wired but not programmed is a figure for ontological curiosity without determinism. A well-worn ontological foreclosure is the wrong body. Ontology is an inquiry into what is. Diagnosis is a heuristic vocabulary posturing as an ontology, an ontological misfire. 
Sexology is an instrument of the dispensation of state violence with the ability to reconfigure minds and bodies as it collates logics along the axes of race, sex, gender, and disability. It is a modality of state discipline, public hygiene, eugenics, reproductive control, and biometric surveillance. It is also an even idiosyncratic and a haphazard consolidation into a discipline, veering toward the pseudoscientific, psychedelic, and transcendental allowing us to see how the operations of sexology as a science cannot be captured in full by models of power devised to theorize syst systematic state repression. Money's taxonomic verve, like Kinsey's, proceeds from the American sexological project's naturalist urge to count, categorize, and proliferate, not to stabilize norms in relation to perversions. Yet sexological ambitions for totalizing taxonomies will always be thwarted by a world brimming with polymorphously perverse inhabitants, infinite in kind. In desiring to populate the taxonomic trees of the sexological apparatus, money's fidgeting with surplus data yields doodles. Doodling is one form of money's taxonomania wrought at the intersection of the sciences of sex and human potential movements, a sensate knowledge elaborated in his peripheral vision. As he tells an interviewer in 1996 for Amazon.com, weirdly, Amazon.com just found John Money and asked him if he used email. It's a very weird kind of moment. Um, anyway, cybernetic history. Um, quote, my thoughts are most emancipated at the end of a pencil in my hand. They get on the word processor later. Quasi-art, quasi-science, his distraction doodles animate a psychedelic boredom in the sexological, a frustrated and rapid-firing proliferation of words and figurations erratically mapped onto human experiences. Against the steadying hand of the diagnostic apparatus, money doodles, forging a diagnostic formalism of tactility growing out of distracted vision. This is four. The apparatus of diagnosis is terminological. Artist and activist Chloe Faith Subilo, an icon of downtown nightlife, moved to New York City in 1982. She worked briefly at Studio 54 and with her collaborator Anoni of Antony and the Johnsons, wrote and performed plays as Black Lips Performance Cult, an avant-garde theater troupe at the Pyramid Club. Subilo was the songwriter and singer for the punk rock band Trans Sisters. Diagnosed with HIV in 1987, she began a decades-long period of critical advocacy work with organizations like ACT UP and the Transsexual Menace, and as the director of the first federally funded HIV prevention program for transgender sex workers. A few months before her death in 2011, Subilo co-curated Trans Euphoria Gender Movers at East Village Gallery Umbrella Arts, exhibiting the work of Genesis Breyer Peorage and Justin Vivian Bond, among others. Her curatorial endeavor signals the importance of making space and staking claims for trans artists and aesthetic practices. Zubilo's autoethnographic meditations and mantras for survival evoke her punk ethos. In her work confronting the shame, stig the shame and stigma and discrimination she was made to experience at emergency rooms and housing shelters, it feels as though the space of the page is inadequate. It's a calendar detailing her medication physical pain, and appointments with a therapist, dentist, physician. It also contains doodles of self-care, one that you can maybe find that says, in all capital letters, burnt out max. Tracing a line in the archive between Jorgensen and Subilo, we can see the inner seas uh, inter, we can see the intersection of a diffuse network of the sciences of sex decentralizing in the neoliberal era of sex administration. A contained and controlling sexological apparatus orchestrated the possibilities for Jorgensen's bodily transformation. In the 1990s, as brain organization research and genetic mapping overtook the sexological taxonomies of psychoendocrinology, the administration of Zubilo's gender felt inextricable from her surveillance by the so Social Security Office and at the homeless shelter. Her drawings consider the intersectionality of diagnosis as a logic, elaborating transgender as a dizzying bureaucracy of sex alongside housing insecurity, policing, disability, illness, and the AIDS crisis. If doodling is a form between drawing and writing, Zubilo makes drawings of language. Her slogans for the welfare state are written in the style of a diary entry, and the mark of her hand and loopy handwriting both intensify and blur the persistence of diagnosis as shape, a shaping force in her social world. 
The aesthetic, she, excuse me, she manipulates the sexological li lexicon into a trans-utopian aesthetic, transposing the delirium of bureaucracy across euphoria and dysphoria. The aesthetic she forges with recursive text captures the space between language and feeling, an optical dissolving, marking the handmade labor of making identity. This is the last section entitled Sightlines. Diagnosis is material organization, an architecture shaping and foreclosing identity and experience. We cannot ask foundational questions about the categories of transgender art and aesthetics without both recognizing and confronting the vulnerability of trans life, the precarity of its aesthetic practices, and the loss of its histories. To take seriously the sacrifices of mothers and fathers demands imagining the conditions of possibility for both an archive and art history of trans aesthetics, which is self-reflexive in formation, undoing to rebuild histories. In Tactility and Distraction, Towson cautions against, quote, a mode of reading ideology into events and artifacts in which the surface phenomenon as an allegory stands as a cipher for uncovering horizon after horizon of otherwise obscure systems of meanings, assuming a contemplative individual when it should instead assume a distracted collective reading with a tactile eye. The constraints of diagnosis and the work born out of the encounter between diagnosis and visual culture illustrate an opening in the social field, not simply an interruption to diagnostic knowledge and classificatory regimes, but a pedagogical site. In an effort to dismantle the violence of diagnosis as a regime of social apprehension, I shift our attention to minor forms and aesthetics co-emergent with diagnostic ways of knowing. Part of the curatorial experiment I am practicing with you is to encounter the archive Part of the thought experiment I am practicing is to encounter the archive in a curatorial rather than simply historiographic mode. I do so because my investment is in a, tra is in a transgender politics and in understanding how a politics does and must intersect with a study. Transgender is neither new nor finished. In illuminating the sexological aesthetics of the administrative and archival formations of trans, I bring us to sites of interaction between taxonomy and feeling to spaces of proximity, intimacy, conflict, and tension. Many of us engage with trans archives to excavate, restore, revise, and reconstruct histories, and to reflect on the effects of a regime of medical pathology as the history of the clinic continues to reverberate in the foreclosure of trans. I parse the entanglement of the body and its transformation by tracing the way aesthetics circulate in the infrastructures of diagnosis. A curatorial method yields objects some might classify as decorative to the scientific apparatus. Staff photography, doodles, and diary-like drawings, internal records of a sort. The contestations of and collaborations with sexological imaginaries form aesthetic ruptures in the bureaucracy, administration, and archive of gender. While the sciences of sex imagine transgender as the outcome of a cutting hand, I propose to read the labor of the hand in its intervention as constructing bodily senses of identity, offering a redescription of transgender in the haptic and felt labors of the handmaid. The intervention of the handmaid is an orientation to method, not a metaphor or anti-metaphor. It is a multiplication of, ge of genealogies of trans aesthetics, an evocation of trans bodies, materials, and aesthetic practices animated by and anchored to fleshy bodies and mobilized as conceptual, social, and political strategies separately from fleshy bodies. It is a performative mode that is both and neither made of the material body nor fictitious and abstract, a flexibility that is necessarily different than ambiguity. The handmade is a felt method for our collective practice, describing the things we work on, like identity, with the sensory and tactile texts and textures. And with sensory uh, and tactile texts and textures. In place of the aesthetically defunct category of identity politics, the handmade is a method of apprehension, a tactile and optical dissolving, out of which we can look and feel for the orders and patterns of bodily knowing. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Um, I have I have so many questions. Um, 
And <clears throat> I just want to start by saying that that, that photograph of Reed Erickson is so crazy. Um, I've also written about it a little bit, you know, where he appears with the leopard. And because it's in a photo album that's just among the papers that he donated mm -hmm. to the One Archive, we, we don't know why he appears with leopards. Mm -hmm. so, and, and I think it's even called, like, you know, uh, Eric with leopard. And, um, but it does, it, it takes us back through a, a concatenation of conversations we've had today about the proximity of the human and the non-human animal um, and the way in which we presume the separation of what might be proximate. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to start with that. But, but the, the, the question that I have for you um, were, came up for me when listening to the, um, the statistics about how many trans people present themselves, presented themselves back in the day for treatment to these various gender clinics. That was the only way to come to the medical industry's attention. And so attention is a huge theme here. Um, and you suggested that 3,000 people presented themselves, was it in Indiana or at the Kinsey? Um, no, at Johns Hopkins in the first five years that they were open. And 20 received mm -hmm. attention. There's a student at USC, Emmett Harson Drejo, with whom I work, who's also doing work on the Stoll Archive. Mm -hmm. And he's writing about the vast number of letters in the archive that are unanswered. So he classifies this as non-patients mm -hmm. who do not come to the attention or are not received as medically appropriate. Um, and I think going back to Aaron, Aaron Manning's work on the Ann Archive, mm -hmm. this suggests that there's the medical diagnostic field, and then there are these multiple other fields of people who are there but not there as Mel was suggesting mm -hmm. at the end of their talk. So yeah. what about this an archive of non-patients who do not get a diagnosis? Yeah, that's so great. I mean, I just want to say something first about Reed Erickson. Yeah. Um, there, so Reed Erickson and John Money also had a very close and weird relationship, and something yeah. I, I didn't sort of fully elaborate around the kind of you know psychedelic and the kind of in, um, questions around induced states is that you know Reed Erickson moved to Mexico. He fled um, U.S. drug enforcement, and he yeah. died. He was addicted to ketamine, and um, he and John Money spent a lot of time together in Mexico, and. There's just a lot of weird, and the only there's sort of some images of them, and these archives are really haphazardly kind of organized for a lot of reasons that have to do with institutions wanting to protect and kind of safeguard um, cultural violence, and um, just to kind of get to what is what is there and what isn't there. So the, the Kinsey archives, where I um, spent three years, have um, the archives of John Money, but also Kinsey and Harry Benjamin, and. People really did seek to kind of have the archives authorize their experience in a strategic way because they were seeking care. And so that one um, thing that I put up, which was like a leaflet that would go into transvesti and be sent out to people, was really kind of an appeal. So a lot of, we think in some ways of sexology as this like punishing and closed network, and it certainly is. And at the same time, there was an appeal to sort of open it and make it more, um, there was kind of an appeal to create diagnostic categories before there were any. Now we're sort of on the other side of that, thinking about how to you know, arrange them differently again. Yeah, and your, I mean, your attention to the occasional, like the doodles, is, is so fascinating for what you call the co-emergence of the mi major and the minor. And it reminds us of how often we pay attention only to the major, even while we seem to be the champions of the minor. And yet, you know, so we continue to tell the story of Christine Jorgensen, you know, over and over mm -hmm. again. And yet, Reed Erickson is available mm -hmm. in the archive, but that is not the story that emerges. And because we tell one story, we end up with a, a political outcome of, for example, the antipathy of feminism to transgenderism. Mm -hmm. But if we told Erickson's story, we would come to a very different, yeah. different political outcome. Yeah. And also, and then to, to ask you just one more point about the aesthetics then, you know, what, how should we read these occasional minor pieces that are not diagnostic mm -hmm. and are yet not not diagnostic? Yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, I loved finding that image of Christine to go to her for a minute because it was, you know, such a different kind of image of her. And there, these sexological archives do kind of catalog themselves and all of these internal records. And I think the doodles could be sort of understood as internal records or self-documentation. And so finding Money's doodles and kind of thinking about his obsession with taxonomizing and that he sort of couldn't quiet his mind. He was kind of like obsessively coming up with all these words. And so I was just imagining him sort of, 
everywhere he would go, all over the world, like hundreds of conferences and kind of taking notes and destroying the conference program, not with like a to-do list, which is what I do, but, um, you know, telling, like a new, <laughs> in its own way. Yeah. but, um, you know, these new words and ideas. And so reading the, the uh, you know, in some of the ways that like, I think Julia has brought our attention to think about craft and the way it's be, been devalued in relationship to, you know, capital F, capital A, fine art is, you know, a re really instructive in terms of thinking about how to read material. It's so weird that John Money thought of himself as an artist. And he even says, yeah. these should be yeah. projected onto a wall. And that's totally strange. Talk about grandiose. Yes. Right? <laughs> but, you know, and so I don't want to say that they're art or not art, but right. um, reading these works, like just handwritten doodles, is we need sort of to find a language of how to describe <laughs> things that fall outside of um, art history and kind of creating a genealogy of trans art and aesthetic practices yeah. to bring these works in that are reflective of the sexological archive. Yeah, that's fantastic. And the, the, the disintegrating boundary between yeah. art and medicine. Mm -hmm. Questions or comments? We have a few minutes. Any thoughts? You're just digesting those doodles. Yes, Eliza. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I wonder if I could prompt you, um, because I have always wanted to ask you about affect and the doodles, mm -hmm. um, about the optical dissolve that you started us out with and um, the story of Taussig. That went a little fast for me, so I'm wondering if you could go back there and. Um, and you've also mentioned the um, kind of <laughs> the, the gap or the, there's a kind of gaping sense between the seen and the felt okay. and that the doodles direct us at that. And I, I'm just mm -hmm. wondering if you could, you could clarify your yeah. and, and speak again about mm -hmm. Taussig because I thought that was a really yeah. interesting go-to uh, departure point. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I think when Jack started us off this morning thinking about, you know, getting outside of regimes of visuality, but not lose, you know, being non-representational, but not in a way that we can lose sight um, of the kind of force of language and of visuality in our world. And so I liked the Taussig, which I um, have to give Rachel Lee credit for. She recommended that piece to me. I had read it once upon a time, and Taussig was, uh, when, he was when he wrote that essay, he was in performance studies at NYU, and so kind of also bringing in that kind of performance studies methodology and perspective. But the idea of sort of experiencing the world through distraction or experiencing the world in such a way that the distraction can be a space where you can like be absorptive of things that we don't yet know felt really important. And so by the reverse, so when he's sort of walking around New York City with his kid, he's sort of not paying attention. And there feels like that distraction is also part of what doodling is. And if we read the product of the result of that kind of like doodling hand, you know, I'm kind of like here with you and I'm kind of creating new terms over here in this weird wandering hand, just kind of brought me to this place where um, there's like a geometry to use some kind of, you know, relational language between the fabrication and the optical, that it's not about the hand versus the eyes, but it's about some sort of connective tissue between them. Um, and even with kind of Chloe using this kind of strange lexicon and the blurring that she creates with her echo chamber of words, some of it is like this demand, you know, can we have your attention? Can we have your attention? And repeating the sacrifices of mothers and fathers, it feels like some of it has this kind of demanding manifesto like quality to it, and some of it is actually like this blurring, dizzying, disorienting, and that brings us to, I think, an, you know, an, an important place when we're trying to create or uncreate categories, you know. So for all of you who've been doodling on your programs, <laughs> could come back to haunt you or damn you later. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Jean. Um, we're going to, we'll take a, the, just the shortest of breaks while we set up a video in which um, Paul is gonna come on and explain to us two videos that we're gonna see by disabled trans artist, Lorenza Botner. Um, so give us five minutes and thank you, Jean. Thank you.